Good afternoon, everybody. I'm just pausing to allow those in attendance to take their seats. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute of International and European Affairs in Dublin. It's my real honour to welcome you to this event this afternoon on European Union and African Union relations, a joint vision for 2030 with Ambassador Javier Nino Perez. It's also it's a real delight to welcome back uh, Dr. Susan Murphy, who's Associate Professor in Development Practice at Trinity College Dublin, who's going to be chairing the event today. Uh, Professor Murphy is the principal investigator on the European Research Council funded project, Geoformations, Geographies of Dynamic Governance, Assemblages and Development Cooperation, Civil Society Spaces, which is a five year project and a real kind of a really eminent thing to, to be doing um, on, on behalf of um, Trinity College Dublin and indeed the on behalf of people who are interested in knowledge everywhere, a really interesting uh, project. And it's it's really great for you to carve out the time, Susan, to be with us, notwithstanding everything else you have on your day. So without further ado, it's my real pleasure to hand over to you, uh, Susan Murphy, if you could please introduce our speaker and take us away. Thanks so much, Barry, and thanks, Emma, and the team at IEA. Uh, it's a real delight and pleasure to be here today. Um, I have a, a fantastic uh, um, role uh, today uh, to be part of this conversation and this discussion. So I'm really pleased to welcome everybody to this webinar. Um, I am particularly delighted to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Ambassador Javier Nino Perez, who is joining us today from Addis Ababa. Uh, Ambassador Nino Perez is the uh, head of delegation for the European delegation to the African Union. Um, and will be speaking with us today about Euro the European Union and African Union relations, uh, a joint vision for 2030. I'm really excited to hear this discussion today uh, because we are going to hear um, Ambassador Nino Perez's perspective and his, his view and vision and share with us his view and vision around partnerships and the European Union's commitment to its partnerships with the African Union and their commitment to multilateralism, to reducing global inequalities, to strengthening solidarity, to promoting international cooperation and to fighting and mitigating uh, climate change. So once Ambassador uh, Nino Perez has given his address, we will then go to questions and answers with our audience uh, on Zoom and for the remainder of the time. Um, as this is an online event, uh, you are invited and you're able to join the discussion by using the Q&A function, uh, which you should see on your screen. Please feel free to send us your questions throughout the session as they occur to you. And please ensure that you do mention your name and your affiliation with the question. A quick reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both recorded, uh, so you'll also be able to join the conversation here and on X. Uh, if you do join the conversation online on X, please use the Twitter handle or the X handle uh, at IIEA and please tag us on any posts that you wish to share about the event on social media. And so now I have the task of briefly introducing uh, our wonderful speaker today, Ambassador Nino Perez. Um, the ambassador is the, as I've noted, the head of delegation uh, for the, the European delegation at the African Union. And this is a position that he has held since January, so the beginning of this year in 2024. Uh, prior to this, uh, he was engaged in various positions within uh, the European External Action Services and the European Commission, including director and deputy managing director for the Americas, head of division for the US and Canada, and head of division in Turkey. He has served as an ambassador in Haiti and Cuba and has held various positions uh, within the political and economic sections of the European Commission uh, and their delegations in Trinidad and Tobago and Burkina Faso. Ambassador Nino Perez holds a master's in advanced political studies uh, from the College of Europe in Bruges, an LLM in European law from the Free University in Brussels and a degree in law from the University of Valle. I'm going to I'm going to be really, really, really poor in my pronunciation here. So please correct me, Ambassador. Uh, Valal Dolid in Spain. So with that, I am delighted to introduce and hand over to Ambassador Nino Perez. Over to you. Uh, Professor Murphy, dear, uh, dear Susan, truly, uh, truly a pleasure. Uh, equally, my greetings to Barry Emma, all the team at the Institute and good afternoon to you all. Um, I'm really a bit overwhelmed, actually, I have to say, because I'm very familiar with the work of the Institute and I'm really well aware of the, 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 the speakers that you have had in the past from Ban Ki-moon to my friend David O'Sullivan. So, as I said, I'm a bit overwhelmed. 
and I hope that um, I could share some interesting thoughts with you. I'm also being humble, um, uh, Susan and colleagues, because as you said, you 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 read my disclaimer. I've been doing this for eight months, uh, so take whatever I said with a bit of a grain of salt. I know that many uh, today will know much more about Africa than I do, uh, so I'm not going to try to lecture anyone on Africa's problems of Africa solutions. What I will try to do is as candidly as I can share with you my first impressions after these eight months, maybe put a number of questions on the table, hoping that I would also can uh, take uh, your, your advice. And at the risk of being undiplomatic, I've always been impressed with the lucidity, uh, with the common sense of Irish, Ireland's foreign policy and of the Institute. I'm sure whatever you tell me uh, can be very useful in the months and years ahead. Um, listen, the first thing I want to say is to to share a bit, uh, once one comes to Africa, I served in Africa many years ago, as you said, uh, Susan, but I, you know, I was coming back up to 20 years. And when taking a step back, what is, is relatively simple to understand the magnitude of the challenge, uh, what, what, what it, it is about uh, working in Africa. You know, this is a continent that is seven times the size of Europe, three times the population, yet one ninth of our uh, GDP. Uh, this is a grouping, the African Union, that brings together 55 members, 54 uh, countries. This is a continent that, of course, stirs passions, and uh, you can look at it with the half-full or half-empty bottle approach. You know, this is, this is, as I said, the level of socioeconomic development is what it is. 19 of the 20 poorest countries in the world are in Africa, yet 11 of the 20 fastest growing economies are in Africa. You're all familiar with the number of conflicts afflicting the continent, the socioeconomic uh, challenges. At the same time, this is a continent rich in natural resources, critical raw materials, 50% of uh, the reserve for manganese, of cobalt, a vibrant youth population. So as I said, just uh, taking a step back and trying to first maybe frame in this in the understanding that Africa is a, is a big continent and a very diverse continent, of course. I will limit myself, if you allow me, uh, Susan and, and, and friends, to, to limit uh, my presentation to the partnership because, you know, we could spend days and months discussing Africa, but I work on a daily basis on the EU-AU partnership, and maybe this is where I should focus because that might be where I have uh, more interesting thoughts to share with you. And pointing to the challenges, uh, because this is what we need to uh, look into today or over the next few months, how to develop or fully develop the potential of this partnership by identifying the areas where things could do better, could be done uh, better, maybe. Um, let me first refer to the African Union and the African Union uh, Commission. After eight months on the job, as I said, I have three still uh, rather existential questions that I keep asking uh, to myself. And, uh, and, uh, and, and in a way makes me uh, show a lot of empathy to my counterparts in the African Union Commission. The first existential question is, how does one set priorities when it comes to the African Union Commission? Um, there's two parallel processes ongoing, I believe. One is uh, how the African Union Commission is working on the very legitimate and, and interesting long-term challenges of the continent and processes. Let me give you a couple of examples. The African Union Commission is working on the setting up of a common free trade area. Uh, they're also working on the implementation of a common market for aviation, a common market for electricity. As I said, very commonsensical uh, objectives, um, very complex processes, but the standing sharp contracts to the dire situation of many Africans in this continent. So, you know, we can all agree on the adequacy of setting up progressively a common market for electricity to reduce the price of energy, to facilitate access of energy. But at the same time, 600 million Africans don't have access to electricity. It is absolutely, again, a commonsensical and opportune to discuss a common market of aviation, to reduce costs. But at the same time, as we all know, probably roughly 70, 80% of Africans cannot afford to get on a plane. Uh, the same applies to the common free trade area. Uh, one wish that this would be a reality tomorrow. Three African countries can produce enough wheat for the entire continent, and yet Africa imports most of its, its wheat. So, but at the same time, um, when one looks at the difficulties of the common free trade area, one wonders how realistic this prospect is in the, in the short term. So this is one first existential question, how to combine those two, I don't want to say conflicting agendas, 
the complementary agendas and how to set up priorities is a difficult challenge for the African Union Commission. The second sort of correlated question is a bit of, again, of a philosophical or existential one. What is continental integrations? What is Pan-Africanism? You are, many of you, familiar with the different takes on, on this process, going back to Kwame Kruma, to Julius Nyerere, uh, bottom up, top down, how do you build uh, really a sense of, of integration? And 20 years after the establishment of the African Union, I think that question is still on the table. Um, how committed are the 55 members of the African Union to the process of integration? Or at least how do they see this process? Uh, and let me uh, tell you, Susan, something, uh, or maybe go back to a remark by the chairperson of the African Union Commission, uh, 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 Musa Faki, at the last summit. As we speak, 93% of the decisions of the African Union Commission that are not implemented. You can only possibly imagine what that would be in Europe if 93% of the decisions of the European Commission would not be implemented. What that fact really um, uh, reflects is, is this profound um, or very difficult discussion among the 55 members of the member state of how fast this process should unfold and how it should unfold. And this is, this is something we struggle with and they struggle with um, I don't want to say that we are getting closer to a make or break point, uh, because this is ultimately up to the African side, but one gets the sense that many colleagues, many counterparts in the African Union Commission, in the regional economic communities, in African countries, keep asking themselves this question, what, how fast should we go, how far should we go, are we on the right track, uh, should we, as we've done in the Europe in the past, should we deepen before enlarging our agenda? This is a real question, and again, a very, very, a very complex one. That also, uh, let me be very candid, that also translates into issues related to funding. Mm -hmm. Two thirds of the funding of the African Union Commission, the functioning comes from external donors. So, so I think it's only legitimate to ourselves. Is that really the best way forward in terms of credibility, in terms of assertiveness of the organization? And I can only praise the work of my counterparts of the African Union Commission, but it's a, it's a real struggle for them to come to a situation where, for instance, the African Union Commission will be self-financed. It would take basically 12 million euro by, by each member state. There's 55 member states and the budget is 600 million. So how do we see the process forward? We all agree that it's necessary to deeper, to go for further integration, but how fast, how committed are all the member states to this process is a real, is a real question mark for me. And the third, again, existential question almost, and, and, and you are very well of today's incredibly complex world, Susan, how does Africa position itself international and how is that position translated by the African Union Commission in, in international gatherings, in international setting? Africa, and it's a very good uh, positive development, is now a member of the G20. The EU was wholeheartedly behind the African bid during the African, uh, in the G20. But how um, able will the African Union Commission be to go to those G20 meetings and, and convey a common view on societal models, on the environment, on the reform of financial institutions. Of course, it's a long way to go till the African Union uh, Commission gets to the point where the European Commission is internationally. But still, it's a, it's a question mark in terms of, uh, can we really talk about common African views internationally? Because that's a precondition, obviously, to engage with them internationally. And we're fully committed, obviously, to help Africa and our African counterparts in that undertaking at a point where you see the struggle between liberal democracies, between authoritarian regimes, and, and where sometimes one has problems identifying Africa's position. And I'll, I'll get back to, the, um, to that um, uh, a bit later. So this is three initial thoughts on, on, um, on how we see the African Union Commission and the challenges, as I said, I think it's only remarkable uh, to think about the progress that has been made considering, as I said before, what, what the, the, the magnitude of the challenge and the 55 members and the, and the number of, of, of problems that, that, that they face. How about ourselves? How about the EU? Because this is not just about Africa, it takes two to tango or to, uh, to salsa or to dance here in Africa as well. I think that we also need to ask uh, ourselves a number of existential questions. The first one, again, very much related to today's world affairs is how do we see Africa in our, in our set of priorities? Mm -hmm. 
The world has changed uh, significantly since the last summit in 2022, the joint vision you were referring to, the 2030 vision. In the meantime, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. In the meantime, the Middle East has again uh, imploded. Uh, uh, we still have uh, the neighborhood, we still have the Western Balkans, we still have to look at Asia. So when it comes to the African Union Commission, I dying with them. Where are we now in terms of the European Union foreign policy? And, and this, is, this is clearly uh, something that we need to reflect upon now that there's a new leadership in the European Union, a new commission coming in, a new European Parliament, a new European uh, landscape when it comes to politics. So what is going to be our response to uh, prioritizing Africa or not? And I mean that, and when I say prioritizing, I'm talking about foreign policy, I'm talking about engagement on development cooperation, on investment, on trade-related issues, on a work on migration. So this is something we need to think about over the next a few months. And again, it would be great to, to get your take. I, for one, and, and comes with the job, I want to say that uh, Africa should remain on our top list of priorities, not least because of the geographical proximity, but also because of the of the many interests that that bring us together. Uh, let's think international and and realize that if we if we were to uh, present a common position internationally, we were doing so by uh, by bringing 40 percent of the votes of the UN General Assembly. So it's a is possibly the most powerful and meaningful international partnership one could think about in terms of continent to continent. Um, another incredibly important element, and uh, and Olivia Leslie, your lovely ambassador to uh, to Addis Ababa and the African Union, was sharing her thoughts with me recently. Is uh, how how do we rebuild trust with this continent? Um, we're all painfully aware of the colonial past of some of the EU member states. Not all of them have colonial past. Well, some of them have a colonial passport from the other side of the table, uh, but it's clearly an issue in our dialogue with the African Union and with the African Union Commission. I, I, meet, I meet ambassadors in Addis who in their youth were given a Kalashnikov by the Russians to fight uh, for independence or to fight the apartheid regime. It's very difficult to change that mindset. Uh, I, for one, think that in spite of our sometimes faithful, sometimes positive past, we have much more in common with Africa than other countries and other partners, but still, this is really an issue. We come with a lot of baggage to Africa. So we need to look at this issue candidly, but also constructively, possibly looking into the future, whilst acknowledging that our common history is, is there. And very much related to the tone of our dialogue, to how we speak to each other, is again, how we prioritize uh, 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 agenda items in, in our dialogue. You know, the 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 the, the, the the long list of issues we have to work with Africa and we have to uh, engage with Africa, listening to each other, learning from each other is almost endless. Migration, the environment, business security, energy, human rights, democracy. So going back to the point that the African Union Commission is, is uh, facing, how do we prioritize uh, as Europe? Clearly and politically, there's a number of issues that stand out. The environment and the green revolution and migration, together with peace and security, are maybe sort of the holy trinity of our dialogue. But how do we go about it is, um, is a different matters, and how do we work at the same time for many, many other issues. A third element, maybe, when it comes to our partnership with Africa is to... and, and uh, how to give a positive spin to the partnership. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm taking things from a European perspective. When one thinks about Africa, it's very difficult to uh, look at the bright side. Eh? It's all about the migrants coming into Southern Italy or South Spain, it's about security threats, it's about socioeconomic, uh, socioeconomic uh, challenges. Uh, but, but Africa is a vibrant continent, going again to the youth, to the rapid economic growth, uh, to the rich um, uh, cultural diversity, yet the public perception is rather negative in Europe. Uh, and when it comes to Africa, because of what has happened in the Ukraine, because of what has happened in the Middle East, because of our colonial past, because of uh, the migration uh, uh, phenomenon, uh, how migration is being tackled, approach, or, or impact in our relationship, there is sometimes a bit of a negative spin to our partnership, and we need to find ways to work around that and, and, and think positively about Africa, because I think we can think positively about, about Africa. Um, maybe, and because I don't want to take too long, and, and as you said, it would be great to have a Q&A &A where, where I have the feeling I will, I will take what I will give. 
but still it would be it would be interesting to with you is to look forward into to quote Johnny Logan, what's another year? What a phenomenal year ahead of us uh, we will have in 2025. Uh, we're supposed to engage at the higher level uh, with the summit in 2025. Is 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 clearly uh, enshrined in the in the mandate of the high representative, uh, Carlos coming in. We're supposed to have a ministerial meeting as well. We need to work on a commission to commission meeting um, in 2025. High level and make sure that would be incredibly important to mark uh, the, the 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 relevance we give to each other. Because in the meantime, Africa has been engaged with a number of partners. We had the recent summits of the African Union had recent summits that at a high level with Japan, with China, with Korea, with Russia. So you know, it's 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 obviously absolutely essential that in 2025 we get together. But that we get together, not just to uh, tick the box uh, and, and, and do what we have to do institutionally, but to do so in a way that somehow changes the narrative and that brings uh, traction to the process. And I think that in order to do so, um, Africa should come uh, maybe with the new commission coming in. They will have a, a new leadership in February 2025. They should bring us... Um, maybe a clear idea of where they stand in terms of their own integration process and their positioning internationally. And also, uh, speaking very candidly, also their view on how we can help each other and make this a win-win process. It's, the partnership is very, is very often about what Europe can do with Africa, which is only logical, but it should be also about what Africa can do uh, for, for the EU. Um, let me take the multilateral arena. I think it is only legitimate to affirm that the EU should stand behind Africa's efforts to be uh, represented internationally more meaningfully. You know, we all ask ourselves, how is it possible that in the 21st century, Africa doesn't have a permanent seat in the UN Security Council? I think it's a very legitimate question. At the same time, Africa should think how, once this more meaningful presence is there, how we can work together on a number of issues where in principle we agree, whether this is uh, human rights, whether this is a multilateral system, whether this is promoting democracy. So it should be a bit of a win-win. And I think the African leadership hopefully will come to the summit, will come to the ministerial with clear ideas and also clear ideas on how they see their own integration process so that we can, we can keep supporting them as we want to. And Europe shall go to these meetings with a clear idea of where we stand internationally, uh, where Africa stands in our international agenda, uh, the High Representative, the President of the European Commission, the President of the Council will have time to reassess the world as we, the world we face today. And, and I hope, and it's my sincere hope, that it will come with a genuine offer for enhanced political dialogue, for enhanced financial commitment. We have the global gateway process unfolding, 150 billion for more investment in Africa, more trade in Africa, careful consideration of Africans' concerns related to many issues, to deforestation, uh, to due diligence. So hopefully that will be uh, that will be uh, the case. Um, and, and just to sum up, uh, let me just uh, end rather provocatively by, by referring to uh, what somebody sent me shortly after after I arrived. One of my interlocutors, I won I won name my interlocutor, but I said African Union Commission and the African Union EU partnership in terms of process, it is or they are as dysfunctional as they are indispensable. Now, I would challenge the dysfunctionality of the process because I think that against many odds, Africa is making progress. Against many odds, Europe is still invested in Africa, is still very committed to Africa, but I will certainly not challenge the indispensability of this partnership. Africa's prosperity and stability is clearly a precondition to Europe's prosperity and stability. And it's what that task in mind that I will be working over the next few months, a couple of years, and I hopefully armed with new arguments to make progress with the advice you might give me uh, today. Many thanks, Susan, and many thanks all for your patience and attention.